Hello and welcome to you all. My name is Rory Nolan and I have the distinct honour and profound privilege to launch the Manifesto Showcase for the Gaiety School of Acting's graduating class 2021. As a graduate of the Gaiety School of Acting myself of almost 20 years, I can confirm that at the heart of the Gaiety School of Acting is a relentless pursuit of creative, meaningful expression. And the Manifesto Showcase embodies this. It empowers the actor by giving them the skills necessary to write, direct and produce their own work. All the work you're going to see today has been written and performed by the actors themselves. Alan Howley directs and all the pieces have been made intended for the stage and filmed at Smock Alley Theatre. I myself personally am immensely proud of the work that these actors have done and uh, I wish them all the best as they embark on their journey into our wonderful industry and I know that all of you will welcome them with open arms. I'd like to thank you personally for taking your time out today. Uh, I know how busy you are so it means a lot to me and to them and to everyone at the Gaiety School of Acting. The class of 2021 is a vital part of history. Uh, this industry has been decimated over the last year, so what these actors have gone through is all the more special and profound when you think about it. Uh, creating and learning through a pandemic is no mean feat. So if I could offer them any piece of advice, which is probably moot to this cohort of wonderful actors, it would be to keep exploring, keep discovering, be true to yourself and love what you do. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honour to introduce you to the graduating class of the Gaiety School of Acting of 2021. Thank you. Danny Ryan is at my party. Danny fucking Ryan. <laughs> Who's that? He's so fine. Me, oh my, it's Danny Ryan. They used to scream that in school. Well, the girls did anyway. He's so tall and built like a house. Like some six foot four bed semi detached. He's doing that thing, you know, when a guy leans on something and all you can see is that bulge, that bulging tricep. You know, when a guy goes like this and all you can see is this about to pop out of his arm and... <sighs> Listen, four eternities at level five restrictions and the first party I throw, the first man that walks through my door is Danny fucking Ryan and he's doing the arm lean tricep thing. See, me and Danny, Danny and I, <laughs> have always had this thing. Yes, we might be in college now, and yes, he might have a girlfriend, but <laughs> she doesn't know. She doesn't know that in secondary school we were all at a sleepover, we all played nervous, everyone else snuck out for a smoke, and then he asked me to wank him off under the duvet. Hmm. I was top four in his top 16 on Bebo, till he left for the institute in fourth year. When he left, he messaged the lads' WhatsApp group and was all like, I'll miss his lads. But <laughs> we all know what lad he was talking about. Me. He was talking about me. My mum always says it's not uncommon for boys that age to have phases, but... My dad still says that about me, and here we are. <coughs> See, Danny's the Romeo to my Juliet. The tick to my tock, the bread to my butter, the cunnel to my chain, the Thelma to my Louise. <laughs> With less Grand Canyon, but you get what I mean. Oh my God, he just looked over. He just looked over again. <laughs> That eye contact. No, eye contract. And I am gonna sign all over that dotted line. You've got this. Just be 
Casual. Hello, Monsieur Ryan. <laughs> I barely saw you there. <laughs> How have you been? It's been too long, silly. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, Danny, good one. <laughs> Who am I? Who are you? <laughs> it's Mark. Mark from secondary school. I can't stop thinking about it. Can I go out and play? He said. Leave me alone, Jonathan. He scuttled out the door. And the last thing I remember clearly was seeing Nasher barking after him. And his little red wellies skipping away. It was his favourite colour, you see. And it matched him perfectly. Little bursts of fire wherever he went. The rest is a bit of a blur, I suppose. Well, his anniversary is coming up and, well, I suppose things aren't great. I don't really have anyone to turn to because I can't look at mum or dad because I feel so guilty. It's my fault and I don't know how I'm going to forgive myself for what I've done. It's my fault and I can't breathe and I can't think and my head is telling me things I don't want to hear and I suppose I just, I... I just wanted someone to turn to. I can still smell it, you know. The smell of the pit. He was all alone, down there in the dark, gone in for a damn dog. It just doesn't make sense how, how are we so stupid? We could have stopped it and I just left him out that door. I feel sick. I often wonder which one died first. Do you think pets are allowed into heaven, Father? I'm sure he won't be alone. You know, the weird thing is, Mam had always said she wanted two children. One boy, and one girl, and that's what she got just the other way around. Dad had always said his one regret in life was not having more children, but time didn't allow for it. But the reality is you only need one. The perfect one. And the perfect one was Jonathan. Curtains, father. What about them, Kate? I never noticed the curtains were red. Poor old day for a funeral. Yeah, he says it every time. Without fail. And I'll never know if it's just a, a conversation starter or some backwards way of making a client feel better. Because, you know, he does that a lot too. But really, he's a very intelligent guy. That's why I look up to him. Ever since I had him for leaving certain maths grinds, he has been endowing me with these little nuggets of wisdom. Now, I was a jumped up prick at first, so unfortunately most of them went in one ear and out the other. 
But a few did stick out to me. There's no point getting older if you don't get wiser. Or if you're opening a funeral home, make sure you pick a small location with a big client base. And probably the most important one, if you act like you know what you're doing, you look like it too. Oh, well, that's exactly what we did. And we set out and we got the nicest cheap suits we could afford. We stood tall with our heads held high and were only ever as nice and polite as seemed appropriate. And business took off. I mean, it really took off. And we work round the clock now all year, 24 seven. We've only grown closer. Until tonight, that is. But tonight we're celebrating five years in business together. And we're down in the Maple Leaf, which is the two of us. We said we go for one, and one turns into three, three turns into eight or nine. Anyway, long story short, we get too loud, Burner gets grumpy, kicks us out. So now we're standing on the street in the cold. And I'm ready to call it a night, you know, throw in the towel, hit the hay. No, 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 he says, don't worry. And he opens his blazer and shows me his hip flask. Come on, we'll go celebrate somewhere else. Right, I say. So we start walking. It's about 3 a.m. at this point and we end up turning off down Scart Road. And down there we find this lovely red brick wall. So we hop up, we kick back and crack open the most perfect whiskey I've ever had in my life. After about three swigs, I turn to him to ask him what it was called, and the next thing I know, he's on top of me, forcing his lips into mine. Right, at this point, I'm wondering how long he's felt this way about me. You know, if I'd let him on or misdirected him. Poor old day for a funeral. You know, I'm waiting for him to say it now. I have to keep reminding myself that this time he's the one in the ground. I buried him right there, where he uh, landed. <laughs> Look at the bright side. Well, it looks like I'm in charge now. I've been chatting to this boy for a couple of weeks now. And in case you're wondering, yes, it was a dating app, but you're missing the point because I had a plan. Meet my true love at 16, get engaged in five years and marry when I'm 25. Well, I'm 18 now, so it's not working. And the boys I know, they just have a personality like a slug with looks to match. So, no. I won't settle because I have known what I've wanted since I was 10. I have a scrapbook. He has to be a six foot blonde with hamster cheeks like my dad. And I know our third child's middle name. Mm -hmm. It's going to have a silent Z at the end. I know it's unrealistic, but if there is anyone to blame, you blame Pride and Prejudice. They show you this. This perfect man on a silver platter and a dad. He would just go on about how I need to lower my expectations. So to find Mr. Scrapbook, I had to broaden my horizons. Even though using Tinder, it is like having a finger continuously pointing in your face, going SOS, desperation. But when I saw his face, his eyes, his huge grin taking up half the space on the screen. I had found him, my 
Darcy. <laughs> oh, oh. Hmm. <laughs> he wants to meet me on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm picturing, I'm picturing a, um, uh, a sunset walk on the beach, him graciously offering to hold my hand, our fingers perfectly intertwined. But then a shadow eclipses over me and, well, let me introduce you to the Wicked Witch of the West. My sister, and she's like, Tinder, God, you're so desperate, he won't like you. And I'm like, well, you're a twat and Tom still likes you. <gasps> Why are you so rude? Why are you so ugly? I'm not ugly. And then she pulls my hair, walks off and think that she can get away with it. Oh, no, no, I'm going to even this playing field. So I pull on hers, but then she turns around. There's this fight. Mum rushes in and I'm grounded and I have no phone for 14 days. And I'm really worried. Like, what if he thinks he scared me off? What if he thinks I've ghosted him? What if he's unmatched me and I never find him again? What if he finds someone new? They go on a day, they fall in love, they get married, they have kids, and I die a spinster. Hmm. Yeah. Finally, I get my phone back. Ooh. <laughs> Now I switch it on. Silence is killing me. Darcy was always a pompous prick anyway.
It had been a good week. Made some money. Not much. A few tuppence for labouring on Fitzpatrick's land. It had been a blessing because work had been scarce. So, I do the work. And he come to me and he say, I can't pay you. My family are starving. I say, you're starving. I'm starving. <laughs> I never cursed a man. Never stole from anyone. Never killed a man before that day. Didn't mean to. Man owed me a living. So I caved his skull in with a rock and buried him in his field. And I took what he owed me. Honest pay for honest work. What was I supposed to do? Let him take me for a fool. My family are barely surviving and I can't even provide for them. And that greedy bastard promised me that we'd be looked after. God forgive me, I've committed an unforgivable sin. But is it a sin to feed a starving family? People are stealing and killing each other every day for scraps. I did what I had to do. <laughs> Look what we've become. Slaughtering each other like animals. We reared animals and now we're the animals. I'd do it again if I had to. I couldn't wait to turn 18. The party couldn't be anything less than amazing. The venue, the playlist, and the best part of all, the 18 kisses. I was the youngest in my year, so I had watched every girl have boys queuing up to grant her that kiss on the cheek. It was finally my turn. Not to mention the fact we were graduating in a few weeks and I still hadn't managed to secure a boyfriend before college. The points I got or the course I did were all irrelevant if I had to show up on my first day single. This was my last chance. These 18 kisses were a business opportunity. I could see who was already interested and then make my move. Well, this obviously influenced the guest list. I broke the news to Gary Duffy that the venue only permitted 50 guests and he hadn't made the cut. Told him I have a big family. But really, Gary wasn't known for his good hygiene. He was christened Greasy Gary. I mean, you could cook your Sunday morning fry in his hair as if that wasn't bad enough. One of Gary's five a day included a bag of Tato cheese and onion crisps. Over my dead body was that coming anywhere near moi. The day of the party, the girls arrived at mine for 3 p.m. sharp. The following six hours consisted of hair, makeup, vodka seven ups and finished with a photo shoot in the front lawn. I decided to go with a little goon, a jarug. Classy, elegant, ladylike. I was done with immature, petty boys. I wanted a man. I needed to look like I was oozing with maturity. As I stepped through the door of McCann's function room, I met by a sea of LED lights and 18th birthday balloons. Katy Perry blaring from the speakers, drinks flowing, the night began. Finally, the clock struck 12. A chair was pulled into the middle of the dance floor. It was time. Would there happen to be any handsome young fella here tonight who'd like to give the b -b birthday girl a kiss? A stampede of males form a queue beside the DJ booth. No surprise. I made my way to my throne. All eyes were on me. My stomach was doing backflips. A quick check of the lineup. Perfect. We begin. But it's at Kiss 13 that I get a whiff of an all too familiar scent. My eyes scan the room and finally land on the Tato Mount himself standing at the back of the queue. He's smearing a thick layer of lip balm across his lips. Either my white lie wasn't convincing enough or Gary was too eager and came anyway. I mean, couldn't blame him. 
it did look stunning. But fuck's sake, the night was going so well. Kiss 15 and the scent of cheese and onion is overbearing. 16, I hold my breath and pray that this will be quick. 17, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Gary steps forward, eyes closed, mouth open, and makes a beeline for not my cheek, but for the full shift, I pull back. Just as this six foot blue eyed God appears. Sorry, hope you don't mind. I could see you were in a bit of bother there and I just couldn't miss the opportunity. It was Chris sent to save me. 21, older and wiser, a real man. He was everything I wanted. I lay in bed that night. I'd found my Prince Charming. <laughs> prince Charming. He is the furthest thing from that. Three years in, I still think about that night. Now the cheese and onion don't seem that bad after all. They like what they see in those moments before igneous eternity. Aren't all shells extinct trinkets and fossils little calcified death wrecks? And you have objectified far more than me. Michelangelo knifed marble plagiarisms in Tuscany. Isn't that just like men hack a thing from a rib and pretend it's not them? Margaret Thatcher he likes her. Self-made Gorgon cast in iron, waged war on the miners who thought the rock was theirs. Sometimes when the cave is unenlightening, it echoes the sound of someone. Just a beetle, scuttling. Sometimes I hear his voice again, a uh, mushy red, like Kronos swallowing his child's head.
My deepest condolences to you, Miriam. Yeshua was a good man. He touched all our hearts. We weep for him. You didn't know him. I was 13, betrothed to a carpenter more than three times my senior. And did they ask to use my body? Was my autonomy considered no? I had to bear and rear a child regardless of my will because I was pure. Me on that donkey, swollen and starving. And do you know what I am told? Go, scream with the animals in the barn. Prick. And the pain and the blood and that star and then a boy. My boy. Ripped from my arms by three scholars bearing gifts. Yeshua will save us. He will cure us of sin. Why? Why must you sin? And the mocking. You want to be a king. Well, here's your crown. Him bleeding from his hands and feet. And the breathing stops, and I look out, and the world is grey. And people come and tell me, Yeshua was free of sin, you should be proud. Well, I'd rather him full of sin, and alive. My deepest Condolences to you, Mary. I don't want your condolences. I want my son. It's a lovely day for me. It's a lovely day to walk amongst the trees. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a lovely day for us. It's a lovely day to take a trip on the bus. Hmm. Hmm. It's a lovely day. Well, hello there, boys and girls. My best friend Jeremy and I are doing one of our favorite activities today. We're taking a trip on the bus. Have you noticed a lot of scary people wearing something called face masks these days? Well, don't worry. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's your right to breathe the air in your own country. I think that's our stop. Boop. <laughs> I love going for walks in the park with my best friend. What do you like to do with your best friend? There's so many things. You can high five. You can hug. You can dance.
feeling tired. I think I'll take a little sit down. <laughs> Do join me, boys and girls. It's times like these I like to feed the birds. And here they are now. <laughs> Have you noticed the birds getting a lot crazier than usual? No, it's not because they're robots. It's because of a chemical radiation released in the air known as 5G. That's right, 5G. 5, as in 1, 2, 3, 5. And G, as in the letter G from the alphabet song. And G, as in the letter G from the alphabet song. Jeremy, sing the alphabet song. I think Jeremy's feeling shy today. But remember, shyness can sometimes be a good thing. The shy cat drinks her milk and goes to sleep. The curious cat dies. Cut, 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 cut. Jeremy, you're just not giving me enough energy today. I know, but how are we going to reach the children if you don't? I'm sorry, I'm getting mad. You don't like me like this. I don't like myself like this. I don't like myself. What? Jeremy, you always know what to say. You sly dog. You just wanted more screen time, didn't you? <laughs> oh no, you've earned it. Okay, guys, Jeremy's going to do his monologue because it is beautiful. If you can stop moving and talking when we're filming, please. Thank you. They don't get it like you do. It's a... Uh... You set the trap. You lit the fuse. You tripped the switch. And you loosened the screws, and I have had enough. I'm sick of flying off the cuff. Listen up, shut up. I've had it up to here with your negativity. This relationship that's clouded by your jealousy. I can't be who I want to be, but yet you want to marry me. No. No joy. No laughter. No jokes. I need Obi-Wan Kenobi because I am seeing no hope. But that was your goal. That was your mission, to beat me into submission. To put me into a position where I feel like I'm in prison. I was your bitch. You had me on a leash and then I broke free. And I unleashed the rage of the Hulk and the might of Thor. As the Avengers assembled when I was ready for war, a war in my mind. With my demons. They chase me in my dreams. Like Terminators. Exterminating machines, hunting me down. They want me to drown in my anxieties. It gets to the point where I start to question the probability of me finally being free. My mentality was like a poison. It had no cure. It drove me down a road that led me to be scared and insecure. And my family always try to reassure. They said that I will make enemies. But I have an opportunity to stand with unity 
that I can take the venom inside of me and use it to inspire me. Because there's a fire in me, a desire to be the best that I can be, and now no one can touch me. I have a key that unlocks invincibility. I promise myself that I will not stop the fight, despite the darkness, the evil. I will see the light. I will be all right. I will rid my life of this parasite, and when I do, that day will be paradise. Now I'm in paradise. Well, Dad, love is a funny thing. It makes some people cry and others cry harder. It's like a friend staying on your floor and charging you rent for their company. It's a lose-lose situation, that's why I don't bother. It's easier not to try. It's easier not to feel like you're supposed to be one sad half of a package deal. You ask me this question every single time I come home. And I guess that being a, a bachelor has some sense of sadness about it. I mean, they might have a, a girl for every night of the week, but they're not happy. Never happy. Why aren't they happy? Because they don't choose to be alone. Well, no one chooses to be alone. Something chooses for you. Or someone. What if I said I was made wrong? That the man at the factory made a mistake and was too afraid to get in trouble so he ships me off with the rest as if nothing happened? You'd say I was crazy. Yeah, I thought so too. It took me a while to realise it wasn't my choice. I mean, who would choose meaningless late night encounters on shady street corners? Sidewards glances, fear that fills your lungs, and hands that don't hold you, but use you. Who would choose to go through all of that just for one breath that makes you feel okay for a few seconds, just to be reminded again that you are broken? Turns out there's a wide array of words between right and wrong. The colour bars beneath the endless TV static. The me inside this mess of a situation. But we learn to adapt. Bend. Smile. But not too wide. Feel, but not too much. And exist. But not live. So when am I going to settle down? Soon, Dad. Soon. Three shots in Gunamara. Without friends, phones are festivals. Are you fucking well? We'll be there by half four, I reckon. Darn me, Ad. They don't start taking students until five. Well, they're not going to turn you away. Over the last week, while I packed for something rank, Moam Agasmiyad packed for unrank. You know, wine, baguettes and cigarettes. And my parents are ready to throw me out of a moving car if it means they get Aaron Echelon a second niece Lua. I walk into an old holoscolia and there's a very tall, thin woman, La Mirna Voldemort, standing there on Stoche. She has a badge that reads Preavija. Everyone here seems to have come with their friends, unlike me, in my inner. I look across a sea of Ugg boots and O'Neill's shorts to find dinner or bit I can talk to when someone catches my eye. Daniel Slugsy Kane. 
Tha Daniel of Leon Air School. A player for the county, he's not short on pride or pals, but his muscles seem to have decreased his brain power, if he even had any to begin with. He's arrogant, cocky, and to top it all off, Conche Ganzi Pella on his gold chain a goni. Prick. The Priyavija starts to talk and tells us, Neil Kyad Drogi, alcohol, Tutsiani, phone pokey, bullyacht, no gumma I can see Daniel has found his Kilkenny equivalent. Come on in hand. August Tom Burchaku a kind, August a gariff, we God knows what, because I don't see much to laugh about. Unless Gakthana. The Priyavija is pushing a CD into a very old player. Oh my yeah. This is what I feared the most about these three weeks. The dancing. Barchla Barch August Lana with the rag, Lashon Kelly. I'm looking around frantically for somebody. Ain't in a, but everyone already seems to have a partner. A group of D4 Huns with buns pair off with each other before I can make it over there. Thought it's a gum cut a talk on Tarling. Let a hole, someone pop out of the ground before he sees me. I'm turning for the bathroom door when I hear Slugsy's stupid voice. Ah, Ethan, you're in. Do you glitch, bitch? Fuck. Honig may knock Revain partner, I'll get the August, you know, if he may gear a piece of charity, a ain of. I take a sweaty love as we stand Oscor Birch Colony, sponsored by Hollister, and prepare for Bolly Limney. I attempt once again to run for the Shomer Fulka. A cussy and on Kyol and Daniel pulls me back, Alina. Look, ni Mottleman situation show any more than you do. But we have to put up with it done three shocked in a show. Kiar galore. Three shocked in a Igunamara le Daniel Slugsy Kane. Seems the dancing wasn't my biggest fear after all. Which comes first? The brother or the sister? The ignored or the ignorance, the chalk or the cheese. In our story, first for once comes cheese. More mature, also round face, but let's not. Oh, she's so our nice. special girl. All attention, all love, until I am blessed with an Irish twin. That's chalk. New assumed partner in crime and love until Years passing notice while I talk for Ireland, Chalk gets to speak for a step. Like, similar outsides, but inside not. This isn't right. Mommy, Daddy, look at me! He's just a slow learner. Chalk won't talk to me! So I learned the words awe and tism, and learn Chalk has it, and needs that are special and mine are not, which is not fair. Ask Mommy if he'll share anyway, but he does not. No cheese for chalk. No cheese for chalk. No cheese for chalk. No love for cheese. All love for chalk. Sharing is caring unless you're special. Inside outside life amalgamates and blurs. Loneliness hitting from both worlds like, do you want to play at mine? Isn't your brother? <laughs> He's not contagious. He brother. I hear a new word for awe and tism and needs that are special. It cuts from the throats of those who dare spit it, seemingly a slur, slurred to those whose brains have slurred from birth. But it hurts chalk, so never say it. Promise? Promise, but he. But, but they no. get to, but I hurt too. What, what about chalk? chalk? What about cheese? Me too, growing and becoming me, but who cares? Only the drink I kiss and friends, finally friends who spit angry words and I, in my newfound unloneliness, contribute to the sound of the family home door slamming, taking my mother forever. I'm sorry, I can't. Because it was too much. Her voice fading, dad turns foggy. Motions of caring and father, but inside not there. And I, in my resentment, forced to contribute more than just recklessness. Just to get him out. Why do I Please. have to? Jeez. Fine. Park bench near and around our half-hearted home, we sit, 
watching chundering normalcy, giggling punchable screams of young, noticing mothers who still want to be. Which comes first? Why can't you be normal? Ah! Chalk, stop! Excuse me, could you please? Control him, what kind of... Excuse me, could you please? Control him! Excuse me, could you please? Control him! Shut up, shut up, shut up, you retard! Chalk. Chalk! Chalk.